Don't want to, you don't have to apologize for tech issues with me. I, okay. I totally get it. Okay. It's all good. No worries. Thank you so much. All right. Let's, let's do this. Let's begin. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to learn more about your business and what really creates a passion for you. So tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Uh, so my, my name is Jeff Gargas. I live in the beautiful state of Ohio, uh, a little bit south of Cleveland area. I'm in the Akron area. Um, and I get to work as the CEO uh, of a company that I co-founded about, gosh, we're coming up almost nine years now. Uh, the company is called Teach Better, uh, teachbetter.com. And we work with uh, educators and school districts to help support um, educators in their pursuit to continuously be better for their students and provide their students with uh, the, the, the knowledge, the skills and, and the life lessons to, to be, uh, to go on to fulfill whatever their dreams are and, and meet their full potential. So we do a lot of work with, with school districts and the school teachers themselves. That's like this, probably the shortest I've ever done that. in. so I hope it works. Very impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. But I'm going <laughs> to ask you to, to extend a lot of the, that information okay, to good. a little bit. Um, Love it because, you know, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher trainer. Mm -hmm. I live in Spain right now, but I became a teacher in New Mexico. And one of the things that I was very aware of is that we didn't get enough training. And so when you say you'd like to pass on the skills and that's what you're doing, passing on knowledge and skills and um, techniques for teachers and students so they can go off and live their dreams. Can you tell us what you provide that maybe some of the districts don't provide for teachers? Uh, so we provide very, uh, very customized solutions. Typically, we do a lot of work in um, pedagogical shifts and instructional practices. Um, as far as what we provide versus what a district doesn't, really depends on the district. A lot of districts have do a really great job of providing anything and everything their teachers need. Um, but we like to actually think of that we're one of the things that a district could provide. I said a lot of. I didn't say all the districts, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> right. But some districts do. Some districts do a really good job of, of they have a lot of in-house stuff. But we I, I think that we are more of something that a district could provide um, if it makes sense. And if it's a if there's a, an area of something that we can bring to as a piece of support for uh, for for the district itself, for the ind individual groups of educators um, and, and then obviously for the students via that work. Uh, I think one thing that we bring that's that's super important for us is the support, the ongoing support versus a one and done type training. Here's this cool idea. Good luck. Uh, we believe in being there with the teachers um, as, as often as we can be. You know, what you typically see happens is you get introduced to a new idea. Maybe someone comes in and they either get you inspired with a keynote or they spend a couple of days with you. And, and and they deliver some amazing professional development, uh, great ideas and stuff. And and teachers are excited and they're ready and they're like ready to they're engaged. They put the time in over the next couple of days and they're ready to go in their classroom and implement these things. But then like we get back in a classroom where there's five million things that can go right, wrong, and in between every single day, and we can run into it's inevitable that you can run into issues anytime you're trying to change anything. That's just the reality of it. And what we've found is that a lot of times you run into this, you turn around, there's no one there. Not because your administrator doesn't want to be there, but because sometimes they can't because they're putting out fires too. Uh, we like to be the, the people that can be there um, to help figure out and brainstorm and work through that issue um, to be a, just a supportive lending ear when there's a, if the issue is more of a vent uh, or, you know, complaint or something like that, but to, to be there to help the teachers then actually implement them because they wouldn't be attempting to do that if they didn't believe that it was going to be better for their students. And they don't stop doing it because they actually don't believe it's going to be better. It's because sometimes it's just not possible to do it. So we like to try and be the resource that can allow them to, to actually make the changes that they want to make in their classrooms. All right. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be asking you some specifics about what better does to support, to, to really physically to support the teachers. Um, first, I want to go into the pedagogy a little bit, because what I do is exactly what you were saying. First, I was just hired to give talks and people would say, oh, my goodness, I love that. And they'd go off and maybe do it once or twice. But then, you know, we're, we're creatures of habit and go back to exactly how we were teaching before. And so what I do now is I insist on giving a workshop and then I do coaching and then a workshop mm -hmm. and coaching. And I do three of those sets. And that's okay. where I really see progress. And what I was really attracted to to about to teach her better is that exactly that your support what i'd love you to tell me is what the pedagogy what the methodology is what i love and what i think that in europe they're moving into more are project-based learning 
And I'm wondering if that's what you're you're doing as well. Uh, yes, yeah, some we do uh, quite a bit of project based learning. It's something that we do love to work with districts. Are I think the majority of districts in the United States are a little slower to move there right now, but we are seeing more of that. Uh, we do a lot of work and focus around mastery learning, mastery based learning, personalized, self paced uh, learning. Um, shifting the focus of getting work done and checking boxes to actually deepening the students understanding and actually uh, mastering the concepts that were, that they're supposed to be mastering, actually gaining the skills and knowledge versus just doing the worksheet that was there. But what's it's more on, it's less on the worksheet, more on what was the purpose of that, less on the the new math book or new tech tool, whatever. What was the purpose behind that? And so that's that's a big part of where we really work. And now that can look a million different ways. Sometimes project based learning is a a, a tool and or a solution to a gap or a desire that they have. Sometimes it's uh, it's it's much earlier. It's a shift of how are we breaking down our standards, how are we uh, separating, and um, how are we tiering our assessments to properly uh, give us the right kind of or right kind of and or better feedback. Uh, of where our students are so that we can actually break down where they are and their their depth of knowledge or lack thereof so that we can address the with whatever tools that we need and so yes we do some project-based learning there's some, that's actually something that chad you know one of our co-founders and one of our lead trainers he is he loves uh as a, as do many others on the team but it really depends on what the goals are of the the district and or the the teachers and then where they are in the process of trying to get to those goals and so it can look very different as you know right when you go into school no two classrooms are the same no two grade levels are the same no two buildings and even the same district are the same and so it really comes down to figuring out what they're actually trying to accomplish and how we can uh, or sometimes can't fit into that puzzle of supporting the teachers okay so usually when you go in you get hired by the district by the administrators this but mm -hmm. they, by the teachers or all of the above Basically. Typically, uh, we're typically hired by the, the administrators. Uh, that's usually right. how that works, uh, either at a building level or at a district level, depending on just depending on all the different factors. Um, not I guess technically we could be hired by teachers, but that's only in the sense of like if they're doing online courses or individual coaching or stuff like that. Not nearly as, as often. Uh, typically, it's through the, the district or the building level, depending on. OK, and once they hire you, are you using the books that and the material that they've been using all along and you just help them restructure it or you come in with your own material? No, we don't bring in our so we don't do any curriculum. Uh, we don't sell any of that. We actually believe that. Um, delivering uh, helping educators better understand what they're trying to do uh, and the tools and resources that are or are not available to them based on where they're at uh, is actually the best type of curriculum, because as far as we're concerned, like every piece of knowledge you ever need, every tool you could ever find is available to you on the internet these days and everything like that. So if we can equip teachers to go and create like the, I think the best, the best, um, that's what I'm looking for, like the best tool or the best uh, curriculum, I guess would be, uh, right. is the best strategy, like the best curriculum in my opinion is the one that's created by the teacher who knows their, her students best. Right. Um, so we don't we don't sell any. Yeah, we don't do any curriculum selling. We actually one of our favorite things is when a school district decides after working with us that they no longer need to purchase an insanely expensive curriculum because their teachers are now equipped empowered. and yeah. empowered. Yeah, that's a better word, right? Really empowered to to know because they have the skills, they have the knowledge. Sometimes it's just a mindset shift. Sometimes it's some some additional skills. Sometimes it's resources to create the best curriculum there is based on what their students actually need in the moment. Because we all know the new the new curriculum that comes out in three months, it's like outdated and old news, right? And so we don't do any curriculum. Ours is all, it's based around uh, the actual practices that the teachers uh, put into place, whether mental or actual, you know, tactical, log uh, logistical, you know, tactics that they put in place. Okay, so what it sounds like is you're just helping the teachers take a step back and find purpose, because you did use that word purpose, and I really like that. Look at what the goal is, look at the objective, mm -hmm. and try to make it even deeper. One of your your big cells is, and, and sorry, I don't mean to use the word cell, but you know what I mean. One of the things sure, you really God, highlight, yeah. mm -hmm. teach better, is the grid method, and the grid method is a depth of knowledge tool. And there are a lot of them, right? And depth of knowledge tools are really important to help students think about any issue deeper. Could you just go into that a little bit, how you use yeah, that? Sure, yeah, slight correction. So I, I wouldn't categorize it as a depth of knowledge tool, uh, but rather a depth of knowledge is built into the tool, into the system. And so the grid method is a, it's a 
framework. So it's a student-centered, competency-based framework that allows any teacher, any grade level, any any curriculum, any uh, you know uh, what I'm looking like style, anything like that to implement and effectively run a mastery-based uh, classroom. Uh, DOK is a big piece of that because, as you know, like that's a that's a big part of mastery learning. We're focused on the depth of the knowledge, not did they do the work. And so it really is. It connects to the DOK, I think, in a big way because mastery learning really shifts that again that that thinking and the 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 purpose of what we're doing in our classrooms from they're doing what I told them to do and doing the work that they're supposed to do because I assigned it to. They're actually deepening their knowledge on this specific topic or target or whatever a standard that we're working on. And so it works, you know, one of a lot, the work that we do is really a big piece of breaking down standards. When you think about like the, the number of educators who just haven't looked at their standards in a long time or this way, because they just, they, they didn't have time to, they didn't think to do it, they weren't told to do it, um, or they, maybe they were told not to do it. Um, it's the breaking down of the standard. Go, what is this? What are we actually trying to get our students to understand? What are they? What kind of skills or knowledge are we actually getting them? Are we? What's? A, we can go back to the word purpose. What's the purpose of this focus? Okay, great. We need to break that down. And then what is? What's the the pathway that the students should be taking in order to actually obtain that knowledge at the depth that we're trying to get them to? So the the word method one of the very first things we do actually is. The process of breaking out of standards utilize in depth of knowledge and and building up and we use that also in like our tiered assessment work and we do do just straight up dok training because there's a lot of power in there um but that is like built into the good method where it does it is a great process for um utilizing dok but it goes beyond that obviously uh, quite a ways okay so you've used the term mastery based learning and i just want to make sure that your understanding of it and my understanding is sort of con coincides the mastery based learning is essentially becoming self motivated and going as deep as possible and doing your best work essentially not just handing in any draft or any version but being proud of the work you're turning in is that sort of the angle you're taking um i i think i think for me that goes a little more into the culture that you're hopefully creating in your room where students want to do that they have that intrinsic motivation to do their best and put it in when we talk about mastery base it's really focused on what what the actual outcome goal is for the student what are they supposed to be learning and growing and what is that standard and it's focused on mastery versus completion again it's the focus on like are they actually approach like it's it's no longer like did they yes no whatever it's are they approaching mastery are they actually growing in this this particular subject matter towards this standard that has been laid out or are they just checking off the boxes by doing the work and i think that's the biggest shift from traditional at least here in the states is traditional it's it's all about did they do the homework did they do the the classwork did they complete the assignments versus no did they actually obtain the knowledge because at that point do we really care if they did the homework no now we can talk about rules and all that you know and, and all that type of stuff we can talk about that that's a separate conversation but what really comes into the shift to mastery learning is are they actually mastering the concept and there's a lot of levels of what mastery could mean um and there's you know different levels based on what you're required to do and what your goals are and stuff like that but when we talk about mastery it's about did we get them to the point where or, or are they at least progressing towards mastering the 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 content Versus if you think about like, if you take a really simple concept of two plus two, well, if I say it's four, I've mastered that concept. If I can show that I understand why it's four versus if I did the homework, but I wrote five and I failed, I, I certainly not mastered. But in the traditional class, we still move on to multiplication and division. And now I'm behind because I don't even understand the foundation of it. Where mastery says we'll slow down. If we don't understand the foundation, we don't go on yet. We have to have because we're building off of our depth of knowledge, we have to have this foundational knowledge before we learn the next thing or else it's not, I'm just going to continue to fall behind and I'm not actually going to grow. And so mastery learning takes the shift to that, um, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And so the next logical question is the assessment. And it sounds like you have your own assessment and you try to encourage teachers to use your assessments rather than the usual exams. And what type of assessments are they? Well, it's not so. So again, we don't have any of our own things. We don't share like that. Okay, not, sorry, you did say no, that. You did say that. Yeah, sorry. there is no our thing. There is no our assessment. What we do okay. do work with is is what we what we a lot of times refer to as like tiered assessments, which is looking at what we how we are assessing our students and what that what that what those assessments are actually telling us. So what we found is that a lot of assessments are really DOK one level type assessments. They're asking a lot of DO one 
uh, DOK one, maybe two level questions, uh, questions, whereas most standards are written at level three, sometimes even branching into four, which means when we're assessing our students along the way, what, so what happens a lot of times is you might have a student that's actually doing pretty well on our typical assessments in our classroom, then they go on to state testing and they fail because the, the, uh, the positive work we've done and the, the um, successes they've been having have been at this level, but then they go up here, they get tested, and we haven't figured out that they need help or not. And so a lot of the work we do is, okay, well, let's actually figure out what are, what's the state asking for, because that's what we answer to right now, for right or wrong. Like, what are we actually trying to get them to? What are we actually trying to get them to accomplish? Okay, great. Are our assessments actually assessing that? Are they actually assessing the level to which we need to get them to? And if they aren't, we need to adjust it. So then we'll do work with them on, okay, how do we do that? And that goes back to breaking down the standards. When you're breaking down the standards and you really look at it and go, what is the standard actually asking of our students? You're basically creating your assessments and you can pull questions out of that and data points out of that to then build tiered assessments so that when a student takes that assessment, you're actually getting a good idea of where they're at and now you know where their gaps are and wh whether they're really ready to move on so you better prepare them for the next step. And so it's really about looking at and that can be done with them, whatever kind of assessment tool they use or anything like that. Like what, it doesn't matter there. Again, it's for us, it's about, okay, what are we actually trying to assess and what data are we actually pulling out of that? Now we do so also work with shifting our mindset on assessments. That's not the end point. It's just data for us to now use to now inform our practices and inform our instruction moving forward. Um, so we do a lot of work around that, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And and I love that you begin at the end product because that really is the game. And a lot of this mm -hmm. is playing the game. Um, it's in, it's important in Spain. Uh, I try to encourage teachers to go into project-based learning and they say, yeah, but the inspectors, the administrators want to see grades. And I say, mm -hmm. yeah, you're absolutely right. So you play the game, give the exams also, and try to little by little fit in an alternative assessment. And what you're saying is not necessarily that, but it is saying, Let's take the standards and break them down and use them as the motivating force in the class. Let's make sure that we're going, no matter what we do in the class, the students are geared towards being able to fill those, those standards because that's the game. Yeah. And, and even if you take away the standard and requirement, you just say a goal, whatever, like, like even if no one was telling you what to do, which is obviously not the world we live in and teachers live in and the teachers just like, I really want my students to understand this. Okay, great. It's the same process. How do we get them there? What questions do what right. questions do they need to be able to accurately answer in order for us to say they get it they mastered that and that's that's the key to when it comes to assessment like what questions do we ask because then if they don't get it we know well those are the things that they don't understand which means we need to recover them we need to teach them in a different way we need to give them more practice whatever that might look like and like project based learning like that's just that's just the way of shifting the way in which you're delivering um, the the information and and providing them opportunities to 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 learn and show their skills so you can take project based a project and break it down the same way you would a standard but first you gotta figure out how does this project if they're able to complete this project whatever that looks like what standard or standards does that hit okay great so it's the same thing let's break down all the questions that's right that they need to do and the levels in which they need to answer these questions in order to hit the project because the project is aligned to the standards then if we work them through that they'll they'll meet the standard now there's a lot of conversion in there if you're living in a world where traditional grading is, is how you have to report, but you can actually still have a very standards based, very mastery based uh, classroom and instruction. You can just make sure you're reporting it the way that you have to report. The right. difference is if you're doing, because what you report actually doesn't, the only thing about reporting and what you put on there, whether it's A, B, one, two, five, whatever, is, is it accurately describing the student's level of understanding the material? That's it. And unfortunately, in a lot of traditional systems, it doesn't. What it actually shows is a student's understanding of how to play the game of school. There you go. Yeah. Right. Right. So, like, especially like, because if I'm asking lower level, I'm not getting into the depth that I need to be. Um, if I'm giving points for just behavior, which shouldn't, which should be a different type of. That's not the same. That shouldn't be involved in grades. That's a different type of of learning and and understanding there. But like, it, same with the project. And it's it's well. Because if I don't complete the project, where but where did I go? Because I probably still had growth, right? So where so it's all about breaking that down, I think. So 
uh, again, it's a lot of shifting. And when you shift your mindset and it's just the different purpose of what you're trying to do, you can still use a lot of the tools and the awesome concepts and things you do. You just have to make sure that they're aligned to what we're actually trying to accomplish. All right. So you're going in and helping them structure it. And there's one clarification I wanted to make because I often use the term lower order thinking skills and higher order thinking skills. Mm-hmm. And we're saying the same thing when you're talking about DOK, the first level and the second is lower. Yep. Right. So yeah. I talk about it's just a different way to um, sort of encourage students to move up the depth of knowledge yes. to, from lower or higher order thinking. I just wanted to make that point because I usually use. Well, and we all, the, sometimes we say like move up, but we also, I, I think I also will say go deeper, which is because when we build, we, we, we talk so. about building up your knowledge, right? So you're going up the okay, but like, but right. you're also going deeper. So I, it's, it's visually confusion, I guess, but it depends on how you, yeah. it means the same thing. We're trying to get them to understand more of what we're trying to get them to understand. Like that's the purpose, right? Yes. Okay. And then I just wanted to dive a little bit into the motivation behind the depth of knowledge. And for me, I always tell teachers, my motivation behind everything I am encouraging you to consider, because I don't tell them to do anything, I ask them to consider it, is the technology, the fourth industrial revolution we're living in. And you know that just as well as I do, Mm -hmm. and even more, that technology is taking over. And they say by the year 2030, 30% of the jobs are going to be automated. So what we're trying to do and what you sound like you're doing in Teach Better, and again, why I'm so attracted to the whole system, is that you're helping teachers and students think more deeply so that they can do what technology still can't do. Does that sound, does that resonate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right, our ultimate goal is to prepare these kids for the world that they're going to live in. And that's obviously changed from when I was in school and you were in school and and a lot of teachers were in school. And so we, it's important to be aware of what's, what it, they are or are not going to be uh, required to know in order to pursue whatever life they're hoping to pursue and, and to contribute in whatever way they want to contribute to society. So I, wanna do, I do want to note, like, I love how you said, how did you just say it? You said uh, that you don't uh, tell them to do anything you ask them to consider. And I want to be clear, like, I love that because that's the same way with us. When, and and that's actually where Teach Better sort of comes from is very early on when everything started with the grid method. That was like the thing that started it all. Chad was adamant. He said, I never want to go into a classroom and tell a teacher how to teach because they don't need me to tell them how to teach. Because I just want to say, hey, this thing helped me teach better and maybe it'll help you teach better. And that's why so when we work with districts, that's why I'm very adamant to like catch anytime it's like our thing because it's never our thing. Like we're not trying to sell our thing. We're trying to help you get to a goal that you have and a goal that you're trying to accomplish with your students. And for us, we don't care if the grid method is that thing. Doesn't matter. If you're, if we're hitting the goals that you're trying to do, awesome. Like, and if we can be a part of that, great. If we don't need us, high five. But like, so I I just love that you said that because I think that's super important. I think that's a shift that we're seeing more and more in this world of consulting and coaching and stuff like that with, uh, and education, uh, more and more where it's less about you have to use our thing. You have to do it this way. And like for us, we we very uh, specifically use framework because it's a framework, but it's a very fluid framework. It doesn't look the same in everyone's class. It's like, right, your your assessments don't look the same. Your culture doesn't always look the same. There's no one size fit. It's about finding what works for each individual uh, teacher and school and district and such. So I just want to note on that. I really liked how you said that. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And and from what I know about you, I don't know a lot, Jeff, but I do know that you love to make personal connections. And I think that that's what yes. your business is based on, personal connections and not, not pushing, not obligating, mm-hmm. but finding a bridge so that teachers um, can learn to trust you. And, and teachers are very autonomous just by nature, um, just mm-hmm. by the profession. And they don't want, they don't need someone coming into telling them, but suggestions, oh my goodness. I think in general, we love suggestions and then we can feel yes. out if it works for us. So yeah, and, go ahead. Sorry, go I was just going to say like a hundred percent, like that's really important to us. Like again, like from day one, we never want to go in and tell them what to, but we want to be able to provide them with an option, an idea, um, a resource, hopefully a support and a community. And that's that's what's truly important to us is that, uh, whether you your district ever hires us or not, or did or and does it anymore or whatever, um, or you believe in necessary the exact same things as us, we want to also just be, if we can only be a community or a connection to support that you need in one way or another, like that's enough for us as well. Okay, so I want to talk just a little bit about the support you give before I ask you about music, because I'm dying to ask you okay. about music and what that was all about. <laughs> 
But first, could you tell us how you support, can you give us a, just an overview of how you support the teachers sure. on a long-term basis? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the ways right off the bat is, is when we're in schools and we're working with teachers. So one of our big things is, is our follow-up support. Like you've mentioned that you do as well, the coaching, and that can look a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's literally us just bouncing around in the hallways from classroom to classroom, not doing observations, not with a checklist, not with a clipboard, not whatever, just checking in saying, how you doing? How, what's working? What's not? Do you need anything? And then moving on. And then that's, that's it. Um, sometimes it's, you know, holding additional support sessions or facilitated work sessions and things of that nature. Uh, but we also support a lot in our, just with our community, um, you know, through things like our Facebook page or our Facebook group, um, through the, the fact that we're live all the time, we're live streaming and then trying to bring, uh, introduce you to new people, new faces, new concepts, or just give you a, a place to go and like turn your head off for a little bit. Uh, we have masterminds and different communities for different aspects of the, of our larger community. Um, we really like, like I said, like we, it is important for us. Uh, one of our ultimate goals is to just be a place where on a million different levels and a different avenues that you could take as a teacher to utilize us in our community from very small to very, very in-depth and connected work with us. We don't care where you fall. We just want to be that community. We want to be that 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 resource that you can turn to for whatever it is that you might need. And that's really our, and, and we because we feel like that's the ongoing thing. This, like we're going to see continuous shifts in what's working, what's not working, what the data says, what the research says. And at some some point down the road, we'll probably be talking about how DOK doesn't make sense anymore. And it should be, or it's something else that someone else came out with, or we learned these things that these work better and we'll shift on what we train on and what the workshops are and what to speak on. But what hopefully will always be the same is that we are a place and a brand that people can turn to and go, well, I need this, that, whatever. I'm going to go to teach better because they likely have it or someone in that community has it. So for us, like for me, it's always been, that's like the number one thing we quote unquote sell is the community, which fortunately is free. Like, so that's but a priceless, with. priceless, really. A hundred percent is how I feel at least. I hope others feel that way as well. Yeah. I see that in, in a lot of different courses where it used to just be people taking courses online. Now they're forming communities and there's a huge mm -hmm. difference. People need a human connection, even if it's online. Yeah. So that's Agreed. beautiful. hundred percent good. Yeah. Now, the next question I was going to ask you was, you know, which is your greatest passion of all the businesses that you created? And I'm not going to ask you that, Jeff, because I think that <laughs> I am just going to vote that this is your favorite. This is your favorite business, your biggest passion. And Accurate. You know, I don't care what you did before, except music. <laughs> I'm fascinated by your whole music history. Can okay. you tell us about that? Uh, yeah. So I was in the music industry for, for a while. I played played music, played in bands. Uh, and then, gosh, back in 2005, I think it was, I founded my own record label um, and had a record label for, for a little while where I had uh, ended up having three artists under recording contracts and three oh. others under management contracts. I uh, had a division that was that did promotions and, and put on shows. And I, for a couple of years, we put on 150 shows a year. We did a music conference. We did a lot of different stuff. Got this go, you know, go around the country and actually into Canada and stuff and speak and talk about it and stuff and see some amazing artists do some really cool things. And uh, yeah, so that was my stint in the music industry. It's been a while. It's been a while since I was in there, but uh, I still, you know, still, still, I loved it. It was one of the happiest times of my life for sure. And why did you step back from it? It was, it was a tough time in the industry. It was kind of on the, the, the sort of this weird period between where CD sales were like still a thing, but not really a thing. And uh, streaming wasn't a thing. Like it was starting to be a thing, but it was actually even harder to get into the streaming networks, let alone make any money. They weren't sure how they were going to pay people. Um, we, you know, Spotify oh wasn't God. a thing yet, you know. Um, and so it was a tough time to make money. And I had promised myself when I started the label that as an artist first, that if I ever got to the point where I thought about doing anything sleazy, not necessarily legal, but sleazy uh, to my artist that I, that I, that was it. And I got to the point where we were just, we were struggling. And I was like, I, I'm not going to make any money unless I like take advantage of my artists and keep all the money for myself. And I said, that's my cue. Like I've got to, this thing, this has got to stop. We, we gave it a try. We had some fun. We had some success but it just wasn't, wasn't the right thing. So it was a shift in the industry, also some mistakes on, on you know, our part as a business. And uh, we just weren't in a spot where we could continue and get through and weather through this weird transition that's happened over the last 15 years in the industry. And so I shut it down. Which just shows how honorable you are and how much you've
brought to the educational world. So uh, I'm just wondering if there isn't if there's something I haven't asked you that you'd love us to know about teach better about your business about how you see education. Tell us, you know, your biggest dreams. I don't I don't know. I think you've done a good job. I think you're okay. I do fun fact about the music. I'm not sure if you know this or not, but I actually met Chad, my co-founder, through that. I managed his band. I did so, not. Like, there's a strong connection for us. With there. Yes, there's a huge connection there. So that's actually how we got connected as managed managed this band. And now then everything shut down and we actually reconnected at a later point, coaching some soccer together. And then I went into a world of online marketing. He became a teacher. And eventually when he had this idea, this thing that started to catch on, he's like, I think I want to share this with other people. He asked me about it. And that's sort of where all this started. So, so we have music to thank for that hundred um, percent. So that's a, that's a, that was a big one. So, and we built a lot of that through, you know, a lot of the skills that I bring to the team as I, you know, I'm the one team, not a teacher was never a teacher. Um, I'm actually a four-time college dropout. Uh, I did teach college for a short period of time, which is a whole other story that's got a lot of twists and turns. Um, but you know, when we started, he was the, the education guy. I was the business guy, and we learned from each other. Uh, and you know, a lot of the stuff, the skills that I learned, you know, building our website and doing social media and creating creating things and promoting them and building community was like stuff that we had to learn when I was running the record label because that's what we did. And so. Um, so a lot, lot for music. So, uh, as far as things that I want people to know, I think the biggest thing I've, I've kind of said it, so not to be a broken record, but for us, while yes, we, we do sell stuff. We, we sell professional development. We have online courses that you can buy. Uh, for us, the most important thing is being that community and being that support and being hopefully a brand and a name that when teachers hear the name or see one of our many diamond logos and stuff, they, they feel that it's a place where they can go and look for support and hopefully find it. Um, whether that support is in the form of professional development, uh, you know, uh, online courses, or just through the ability to connect with other people and brainstorm or vent, or just know they're not alone and the challenges that they're going for. That for us is the most important thing um, that we, you know, we say all the time that like, we're not, we're not trying to build a educational consulting company. Like we're trying to build a brand and a community around education to help uh, improve the uh, the incredibly and maybe help make a little bit um, easier or uh, or at least more sustainable uh, the important work that educators do every day. Yeah, I love it, Jeff. Um, especially since you're you're so transparent about the fact that you dropped out of college four times, but you went to college four times as well, and you've just proven that you're an autodidactic learner, and it's not necessary to play the game all the time. Going to college, paying for university, is a big mm -hmm. deal. Sometimes it's important, and sometimes it isn't. Like you're proving is that you know how to learn by yourself, and you're you're sharing that with other people. So where can they find you? And how how often do they need to you know send messages so you'll answer them? Um, so, well, so you can find you know everything's over at teachbetter.com. The team on all social platforms is at Teach Better Team, so we can find us anywhere for there. Uh, if you want to get into that free Facebook group that I've mentioned, that's teachbettergroup.com, or just search Teach Better Team on Facebook. Our page will come up, and then obviously, and then the community will come up. You have to answer like three questions in the Facebook group, but we'll get you in. It's free. Uh, for me personally, uh, I'm at Jeff Gargas, G-A-R-G-A-S, um, on most social media sites except for Instagram. I, I'm at underscore Jeff Gargas. Um, and so you can find me there. My email is Jeff, Jeff J-E-F-F, -F, at teachbetter.com. You can email me. As far as how many times, um, I we, we'll all answer. That's really important to us, to be accessible and to answer. Can I guarantee like a 12-hour turnaround? Not always. I will, you know, but... I will try very hard to get back uh, for DMs and stuff like that. Email is definitely the the safest way. There's a lot of people that get me on on LinkedIn. And I'm like, oh shoot, I keep forgetting to check my LinkedIn more often. So so email is the best way to go, or just the team over at teachbetter.com. Okay, I love it. It's not going to go down a black void. We're actually going to find you, which is really important. I want them <laughs> yes. to find you. It's We're not like hiding. Better. We're very open. We're not hiding anywhere. So. Okay, uh, quick question. I should have asked you this a long time sure. ago. Is this just in your district or are you all over the country? And have you gone, have you crossed borders? Uh, we are all over the country. Um, so actually, like our team, like I'm in Northeast, Northeast Ohio, which is where Chad, Chad's about not, about 35 minutes south of me. Uh, we have team members, a lot of team members in Illinois. we got team members out in um, Colorado, uh, Rhode Island, 
in other states that I can't remember off the top of my head right now, actually one in Canada, uh, we have not gone borders yet. Now we have as far as teachers that are connected, we have teachers all over the world that use the grid method uh, that are connected to us, that are in our mastermind, stuff like that. But as far as our actual official work with districts only in the United States, we have a uh, probably the, the bulk of our clients, Ohio and Illinois, um, but we, we, work, we're, we work with districts out in California, up in New York, um, along the coast, and everything in the middle. So we, we go anywhere where we are able to go help. So there's no real restriction to that. So Perfect. Jeff, thank you so much. I'll put all this in the show notes, and I just can't thank you enough for sharing all this. It's so valuable. Mm -hmm. And I hope people get in touch with you because, as you say, community, and that's what you're all yes. about. Yes. Yes, well, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.